Okay, I think that uh, that looks like the number that we're going to be at. So, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Alden Sahor Marty Wood, uh, and I'm an assistant professor of English here at Rice University, where I'm also on the governing board for the Chow Center for Asian Studies. I'm very excited to be introducing the next installment of the Chow Center's 2020-2021 Transnational Asia Speaker Series with Professor Nerissa S. Balse giving a lecture this afternoon titled Filipina Abjection, Empire and Fascism in Duterte's Republic. Before my introduction, I'd like to first acknowledge the extremely generous sponsorship of the Chow Center for Asian Studies at Rice University for making this event possible. A special thank you also to Heijin Ko and Amber S. for their logistics support. Finally, a note on the question and answer section uh, after Professor Balse's lecture. Uh, we'd very much like all of you to submit questions in real time using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom panel. Uh, if you uh, take your cursor and you hover over the very bottom of your Zoom screen, um, you should see uh, two speaking bubbles that say Q&A underneath. Uh, if you click on that, you can go ahead and you can actually post a question uh, and I will be on the back end receiving these questions and attempting to, to kind of collate them and, and curate them together um, so that hopefully we can bring all of them up uh, during the Q&A session at the very end um, of the lecture. So please do that. You can do it real time and, and don't worry, um, it will just show up on our end of things. So, so please take advantage of that Q&A feature um, as well. Um, and so finally, uh, by way of introduction, let's go ahead and begin. Nerissa S. Balse is a cultural studies scholar and an associate professor in the Department of Asian and Asian American Studies at the State University of New York at Stony Brook, where she's also associate faculty in the Department of Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. Professor Balse was born and raised in Manila. She received a BA in literature and an MA in Philippine studies from De La Salle University, Manila, before going on to work as a journalist in the national capital region, writing articles on Philippine literature, politics, culture, and the arts. She took doctoral studies at the University of California, Berkeley on a Fulbright scholarship, where she received a PhD in ethnic studies. Before joining SUNY Stony Brook's Department of Asian and Asian American Studies, she received a postdoc at the University of Oregon's Department of Ethnic Studies and taught in the University of Massachusetts Amherst's Comparative Literature Program. At Stony Brook, she teaches graduate and undergraduate courses on Asian American literature and popular culture, and her numerous essays have appeared in the Asian American Writers Workshop blog, Verge, Studies in Global Asias, the Journal of Asian American Studies, Social Text, Peace Review, Hitting Critical Mass, and in anthologies such as Positively No Filipinos Allowed, Building Communities and Discourse on Temple University Press in 2006, and a resource guide to Asian American literature put out by the Modern Language Association in 2001. Professor Balse is the author of the book, Body Parts of Empire, Visual Abjection, Filipino Images, and the American Archive, published by the University of Michigan Press in 2016 and Ateneo de Manila University Press in 2017. It is the winner of the 2018 Best Book Award in Cultural Studies from the Filipino section of the Association for Asian American Studies. And the book was also a finalist for the best book in the social sciences for the 2018 Philippine National Book Awards. Professor Balsi's most recent research focuses on race, gender, state violence, and popular culture in the US and the Philippines. She's co-curator of the online art project Dark Lens, Lente ng Karimlan, The Filipino Camera in Duterte's Republic, an online exhibition of Philippine photographs of injustice and loss, featuring commissioned poems and captions by 40 scholars and artists from the Philippines and North America. Dark Lens is currently on view at SUNY Stony Brook's Center for the Study of Inequalities, Social Justice and Policy website. Professor Balsay's crucial research has consistently pushed us to reimagine not only what, is, what it is we see and don't see in the hidden traumatic recesses of US colonialism's lingering hauntings, but to also reconfigure our very act of recognition itself and the uneven flows of power therein. Her work has been singular in its importance for mining what she calls America's shadow archive and in tracing the visual traumas, objectification and abjection of the American colonial and neocolonial gaze in the Philippines. But most importantly, her work never loses its optimism. It powerfully insists that just beyond the frame of the visual and often material disassemblage of Filipino bodies rendered as objects, lies a vista looking on to new Filipino futures 
and the recognition of new Filipino subjectivities. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Narisa Balse to Rice University. Hi, thank you very much for that very generous introduction, um, Alden. Um, maraming salamat uh, to Alden, to Dr. Alden Marte Wood for supporting my research uh, and inviting to give me to, to inviting me to give this talk. Um, I wanted to say uh, magandang hapon to uh, my friends uh, who are uh, in this webinar in this um, event. I also wanted to say. Uh, um, magandang araw uh, to friends in Manila who are also um, here. Um, and I wanted to start off by saying that I'm very grateful that the Chow Center um, has given me a space uh, to present my work. Um, I am a, I'm a Filipino studies scholar as well as an Asian Americanist. Um, and I study the Philippines and its diaspora. Uh, parts of this presentation today will appear as a forthcoming article and a book chapter on Filipino culture. And for this presentation, I use the term Filipino to sometimes uh, refer to citizens of the Philippine Republic. Um, and sometimes, of course, I also use it for immigrants who live in the US um, like myself. I'm aware that the material conditions of Filipino life in the US and the Philippines are not collapsible or the same. Um, I am, however, following the lead of scholars um, in Filipino studies and feminist studies um, on knowledge making about the Philippines and its diaspora. As Martin Manalansan IV and August Espiritu put it, um, Filipino studies is an attempt at new conversations and collaborations beyond studying the Philippines as a nation state to move to and aspire for a more emancipatory politics and futures through different approaches for understanding the meaning of being Filipino. So my current book project, um, Sorry, um, my current book project is an essay against both empire and fascism through a study of Filipino images and texts. Um, I lived in the Philippines for nine months in 2016 and 2017, uh, from 2016 to 2017. And this was the first year of the Duterte regime. And I've been following the events of my homeland um, with anger, sadness, and grief. The Filipino term for homeland is a feminine term. Um, it is inang bayan, which literally translates to motherland. And um, of course, those of us who know uh, the work of Ramona Diaz, motherland is the title of her 2017 documentary, um, uh, which focuses on the lives of urban poor women um, in a maternity ward of a hospital in Manila. To be a Filipina immigrant scholar living in the United States today is to think constantly about Inang Bayan. Um, in African-American literature, uh, Saidiya Hartman writes about um, seeing or witnessing um, the violence of slavery as the original generative act in the creation of, of Black subjectivity and identity. As such, I would add that seeing and witnessing the gener seeing and witnessing the gendered violence of empire and fascism in photographs are generative acts in the creation of Filipino subjectivity and identity. My talk today focuses on images of Filipinas internos, what scholar Nicanor Tiongson has described as a synthesis of the 19th century gown and indigenous Filipino fashions such as the barosaya and the panuelo. Inang Bayan in Philippine nationalist iconography sometimes been represented um, by a woman wearing a terno. Um, and we see this in the, in the latter half of the 20th century as well, but Filipino painters like Fernando Amorsolo would represent uh, Inang Bayan in simpler versions of the terno. Um, many scholars have written about the terno, its different meanings and evolution. 
And it's a long list that includes, of course, the theater and film scholar, Nick, Nick Pyongson, um, art historian, Marian, Marian Pastor Rosses, essayist and fiction writer, Hilda Cordero Fernando, fashion historians like Gino Gonzalez, Jose Maria Carino, uh, Sonia Pinto Nair, uh, theater designer Salvador Bernal, and of course, scholars in my field, uh, Filipino studies um, and gender studies, such as Lucy San Pablo Burns, Denise Cruz, Genevieve Cutario, Mina Rosses, um, Talitha Espiritu, Greta Mew, uh, and Gina Velasco, uh, just to name a few. The soon to be published writing of gender and queer studies scholar Ferdinand Lopez will be an important contribution to the to the discourse on the Terno. But my talk will not really be about fashion. I'm more interested in resisting the beauty of the Terno by tracking its circulation in time from the early 20th century to our current moment. I begin with these archival images, which would look just like an image of Filipina beauty. What we see on this slide are Filipinas of varying ages uh, and skin complexion or color. Uh, very much uh, like the previous slide uh, that I also showed. Um, and in this slide, we see Filipinas wearing ternos, the formal Philippine national dress. The characteristic butterfly sleeves on their dresses and the ornate embroidery and cloth on uh, these women um, suggest that the photograph is from the early part of the 20th century. In my book, uh, Body Parts of Empire, I wrote about how images of Filipinas in Ternos circulated at the time of guerrilla warfare conducted by members of the Katipunan or the Filipino revolutionaries. So these images of Filipina feminine beauty circulated at a time of the violent suppression of the Philippine Revolution for Independence and the Philippine American War of 1899, a war between the US Army and the Katipuneros. Um, we can consider the Terno then as a sign of the violence of empire that began with war, what Dylan Rodriguez has described as America's suspended apocalypse on, um, that happened in the Philippine Islands. At the very moment of the circulation of the icon of the Trans-Pacific um, Filipina, uh, and this term is of course from Denise Cruz, um, what is occluded are accounts of the violence of the Philippine American War. In November 1899, as we know, the Katipunan revolutionaries shifted to guerrilla warfare as they faced certain annihilation, given the 70,000 US troops that landed in Manila um, that summer. Forced to retreat, hide in mountains and jungles, and blend in peasant communities, the Filipino forces fought what is called irregular warfare or guerrilla war. So in a time of guerrilla war, and the treacherous invisibility of the Filipino rebel or the Filipino insurrecto. What circulated were these kinds of images, the Filipina in Eterno. And so I want to move now to another example of the Filipina in Eterno. And this is an image from a children's book from the turn of the 20th century. And of course, I was drawn to this because of the very um, charming uh, paintings. The Filipina is serving hot chocolate to two male symbols of colonial authority, a Spanish priest and an, and an American traveler. The priest makes a joke about how delicious Philippine cocoa tastes. And when the American traveler has a sip of his chocolate or hot chocolate, he agrees that America should certainly seize the islands even just for the cocoa. The lovely Filipina smiles as the two men make jokes about conquest while they drink their hot chocolate. For many years, I have tried to avoid these pretty images of Filipinas in Ternos because I was disturbed by their beauty. But beauty has always been weaponized and used for political purposes, such as who deserved to be considered fully human, who deserved social death and or actual death, who deserved physical pain and punishment. Rather than beauty, what if we see these images as icons of war and colonial conquest? And so I, I sort of pose that here, could we see the Terno as colonial sign? Rather than beauty, um, what if we consider uh, these images as icons of a suspended apocalypse? The intimacies of the Terno and empire is highlighted even more clearly by the photograph's actual origins. 
The photographs of the Filipinas in Ternos are part of the personal collection of a Swedish American who was a general in the US Army. He helped organize the Philippine Constabulary, took part in the military campaigns in Luzon Island, where the practice of water cure torture was perfected. And he later became chief of the Philippine Constabulary, what would later become the Philippine police. He served in the US colonial army for 30 years. And so this photo, so the photographs that we see um, are actual objects that connect um, the history of the Philippine constabulary to Marcos and Duterte's violent military and police. America's imperial past, in particular the wars in Asia, haunt the figure of the Filipina. Philippine photographs from US colonial period, from the US colonial period, are gendered imperial inscriptions. So we begin with these beautiful images of the Filipina in Eterno, reflecting on how photographs reproduce and trace the romance and violence of empire. A Filipino archivist who has done a lot of work on Philippine photographs during the American colonial era is Ricky Punsalan at the University of Michigan. Ricky was the first Filipino scholar to introduce me to the term archival trauma and how scholars who work with photographic images are exposed to painful images of war and different forms of violence, visible and invisible. As we are all suffering from a global pandemic and for Filipinos suffering from the endless news about the violence of the Duterte regime, here are a few care warnings um, to prepare you uh, and to offer a critical frame for viewing uh, the images uh, that I will share today. So for the first care warning, uh, you will see images of naked Asian women. Second, you will see images of Filipinos killed by the Philippine state, notably the Philippine military, anti-communist death squads, and the, and the Philippine police. But photographs are not always in service of state violence, whether it is the colonial or post-colonial modern state, which leads me to my third care warning, Photographs have also, have also been used for and against empire and fascism. As a visual intervention, I'm presenting the photographs with edits. One, when I will show images of naked Asian women, and there will be about maybe seven um, in this talk, I will change the opacity of the photograph so that you can only see a blurred image. I will intentionally blur these images because they do harm by promoting violence against the living. Two, when I will show contemporary images of extrajudicial killings, about six in this talk, um, I will warn the viewer ahead of time before I will show them. I will, however, not blur these images of atrocity because they are evidence of the violence of the Philippine state. They are also historical images of our broken republic taken by a group of brave, talented Filipino photographers who are nicknamed the Nightcrawlers of Manila. The photographs of the drug war return us to the camera's old intimacies with death and state violence. The photographs of extrajudicial killings, what Filipinos refer to commonly as EJKs, are visual texts of our fascist present. So if street children in a Manila slum have no choice but to be exposed, to be forced to look, because the police left a body in a ditch. Those of us in the United States have no choice but to look. We should look, we should not look away because this drug war is supported by our American tax dollars. My third point is on photography, how it is a visual text inscribed with histories. As scholars in post-colonial studies have argued, photographs along with literature, material culture, such as visual art, architecture, forms of governance, etc., are the afterlives of empire and fascism. For the remaining time um, for my presentation, I will move through three sections. One, I'll, summar I'll summarize what I mean by Filipina objection um, through a review of scholarship on objection. Two, we proceed to a reading of visual examples of the Terno as a symbol or sign of empire and fascism. And three, I'll end the presentation with political, politicized objection 
as a frame for seeing victims of Duterte's drug war. Politicized objection centers on the Filipina body in pain, in particular images of widows, daughters, and sisters of victims of extrajudicial killings committed by paramilitary groups and the Philippine police. Politicized objection is an emancipatory project that exposes the violence of colonial beauty and fascist modernity. I propose that by studying and analyzing photographic images and writing on or by Filipino women through abjection, we learn how to read against the colonial or the official narratives of the Philippine state, a counter narrative of the Philippines. This act of close reading and translation are important strategies for meaning making at this time of a pandemic and state-sponsored disinformation under the authoritarian regime of the current 16th president, Rodrigo Roa Duterte. I follow the lead of feminists of color who turn to popular archives to imagine what Saidia Hartman has described as the multitude, the dispossessed, the subaltern, rather than the great men and women of a nation. As I'm writing this book, I'm thinking of all the important writing done by my peers in Asian American studies and ethnic studies on the historical context of the murders that recently happened in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'd like to pause here now to warn you that you will be seeing sexual images from the late 19th century. As American scholars have argued, the mass shootings in Georgia were acts of violence connected to the histories of American wars in Asia, the history of counterinsurgency, and the sexualization of women through the sexualization of women of color through print, through print, through print pornography, um, and um, other, um, as well as other uh, forms of pornography, theater, and various other um, popular forms. Photographs, in particular, pornographic postcards uh, such as these that we see, um, these are from the Victorian era. Uh, these. Postcards are visual texts inscribed by colonial violence. The images we see on this slide are from a pornograph, uh, from a pornography website that sells um, what it markets as vintage ethnic nudes. Sold and shared online, costing about $50 and more, they are part of the culture of war and conquest of imperial nations. Soldiers and travelers collected these images as erotica. And like the Terrano photos, um, we have no information on the names of the women who posed for the photographers. The anonymity and the ubiquity, the common, the commonness, you know, how, how these images are everywhere. You can look them up on uh, the internet. Um, the anonymity and the ubiquity of these images um, underscore how, how there is, there are other kinds of violence that is part of the image. Um, since we have no information on the lives of the women, we have no information on who took these photographs. Um, I want to suggest that uh, we could consider these as, as part of the history of war, counterinsurgency, and pornography. And all these haunt the lives of Asian immigrant women in the US long after the troops have gone. Like specters, these images also haunt our desires. Like the Terno, photo, like the Terno photographs, I, I am ambivalent about these images from the Victorian era. I'm embarrassed and intrigued and intrigued by the images precisely because they are considered dirty pictures, postcards forgotten by history, rejected by historians and gender study scholars because of their provenance. And yet I have to also admit that some of these photographs I find beautiful. Could there be another way to look? Could there be a way to see the brown and black feminine without shame, disgust, or horror? So from the haunting of empire, we turn to a, to a theory from feminist philosophy and, and psychoanalysis, Julia Kristeva's notion of abjection. Um, and I want to think of how this theory might be a way for us to go beyond visual images of the feminine and move to a counter history, 
um, what Jody Blanco has sort of described in his study um, of the Philippine American War. So um, he works on um, race as part of the creation of a counter history. And I want to think of um, how these photographs might be another counter history as well. In my first book, I talked about objection as a way to analyze popular culture and media that circulated during the Philippine American War. Um, objection as a term comes from the Latin word abjicere, which means to expel or to cast out or cast away. Um, the Bulgarian philosopher Julia Kristeva proposed that the abject refers to what is loathed and also what is desired, the feminine, the maternal, and the savage. Abjection is the production of the horror of the other. What with the feminine and the savage as representations of, of both revulsion and desire. Abjection in colonial writing um, is the trope of debasement um, or the metaphor, the figure of speech that we know as debasement. Um, and, this, and this metaphor um, has to do with a constellation of ideas and images such as filth, sin, misery, disease, moral and intellectual degradation. It is no wonder uh, that abjection as a theory resonates uh, for scholars who study race, gender, and sexuality. Um, and what you see in this slide is just a small sample of scholarship on abjection. Scholars such as Karen Shimakawa, Derek Scott, um, Leticia Alvarado, Elaine T and the scholars in the special issue on abjection in Transgender Studies Quarterly illustrate how abjection continues to be useful in understanding what we both loathe and desire. Um, and then uh, these other um, covers here, the smaller uh, images are um, covers of uh, books on, books on um, film, uh, film theory, as well as um, various other, um, fields like art studies, etc. Objection, according to Kristeva, is what is radically separate, loathsome, um, and a primer for and a primer of a culture. So uh, it was meaningful. I wanted to show uh, a children's book, which is a reading primer. Um, and I want us to think of how objection is objection is connected to the idea of a primer for a culture, for understanding a culture. So it is uh, a thing that introduces us to a culture, the way primers are an introduction to reading. Following the work of post-colonial ethnic and queer studies scholars, I use the term objection beyond its psychoanalytic origins, but as a way to understand Philippine life under the Duterte regime. At the center of this project is a discourse of a politicized objection, a term I, I borrow loosely from queer theorist Alberto Sandoval Sanchez as a framework for understanding the mierda y sangre, the shit and blood of empire. But for my new project, I track feminine figures, especially the image of the Filipina across time and how Filipina images serve as primers for reading and understanding the Philippines, empire and fascism. And I'll say more about politicized objection towards the end of my presentation. My own method of reading objection comes from scholars in Filipino studies and cultural studies. And these are covers of books by scholars I engage with in my work. And this is not a complete list. Um, uh, and uh, these are covers uh, of scholars uh, such as Sarita C, uh, Jose Capino, uh, Nefertita Diar, uh, Dylan Rodriguez, Saidia Hartman, and Jacques Rancière. Sarita's new work, The Filipino Primitive, frames my ideas on the significance of what is invisible or occluded in the American colonial archive, how the very existence of American museums and colonial archives underscore the violence of accumulation by dispossession. And that's a term from Sarita C. At the risk of simplifying um, her elegant reading of accumulation, um, I think accumulation is a logic and foundational practice of the American empire and American capitalism. Empire and capitalism accumulates not only land and natural resources, 
but also military and scientific knowledge to establish power. Filipino dispossession, our loss of sovereignty, land, the destruction of Filipino languages and cultural practices, and the deaths that came with US colonial occupation after 1898. All these enabled the Imperial Museum and artifacts such as photographs. In other words, the very existence of colonial images of beauty and sex were enabled by dispossession through war and colonization. C extends the work of race and post-colonial studies scholars when she theorizes that many Filipino images in American museums highlight our status as colonial subjects without properties. I take this phrase, subjects without properties, to mean that in contrast with the white universal subject of Western thought, brown bodies are subjects of property and ownership of the West. And for Filipino colonials and their descendants, they are literal properties of the American empire after 1898. Further, as subjects without properties, brown and by extension black bodies are racialized subjects incapable of thought and judgment. It is, in C's words, the white subject of Western thought or the white subject of transparency, according to Denise de Silva, who possesses a monopoly on the, on, the, on the capacity for thought and judgment. This notion of the subject of imperial dispossession returns me to Kristeva um, and her ideas on abject bodies as savage bodies. After 1898, Filipinos were collected as specimens of savagery. The American Museum then is a product of empire and capital. The museum's archival objects, borrowing the words of Dylan Rodriguez, are a reflection of a genocidal white nationalist imperialist common sense and a reflection of white civilization making and native social liquidation across the Pacific. Rodriguez was not writing about uh, American museums and photographic images, but the Philippine American War of 1899 that ushered the dawn of the American empire and the accumula and accumulation in the Asia Pacific. His reading of this, and, and uh, sorry, uh, and that uh, is from Rodriguez's book, Suspended Apocalypse. Rodriguez's reading of this forgotten American war as a historical moment of white supremacist statecraft and genocide becomes an important context of Philippine photographs from the American colonial era. The Filipino condition, as Rodriguez refers to Filipino American or Filipino immigrant life in the US, must be understood as a, as a social existence entangled with the generative legacy of genocidal contact with the United States that began with a war of conquest that remains unrecognized and forgotten. So the scholars um, here on this slide um, appear in my work and I, I will, uh, I, I'm afraid I might not be able to cite all of them. However, um, uh, they do appear, of course, in, in the book project. Um, what would it mean if we read photographs of Filipinas and Ternos as subjects of white supremacist violence? And here we see a postcard from the private collection of Mario Fair, a New Yorker who retired in Manila. Um, we see a Filipina following the trope, uh, the, the metaphor of the before and after um, of colonial rule. And the image on the left um, is the proper Filipina subject dressed uh, and wearing what might be a white terno blouse. And the image, um, and the image on the right um, uh, is the savage colonial marked by her undress. The postcard suggests that American colonial rule enlightens the uncivilized Filipina. The blurred photograph hovering um, on the on the uh, corner, um, the right corner of the photograph, um, is an image shared with me by archivist Ricky Pinsalan. Um, we see a white American soldier holding, um, uh, sorry, a white American soldier posing with two young indigenous Filipinas. Um, his hands are on the breasts of the young women. What if we read images such as this as a postcard um, that 
works or functions as an index or a sign of colonial war and genocide. In the second decade of American colonial rule, literary magazines in English and Spanish circulated as part of the Filipina suffragette movement. In the 1920s, images of the Filipina in a terno would appear on the cover of magazines uh, such as uh, this. Um, and we also see the image of the, of the Filipina in a terno in advertisements for cigarettes, perfume, and other domestic goods. But by the 1920s, Manila was under surveillance and, contr and control of the colonial police. The icon of the Filipina suffragette, um, the icon of the Filipina suffragette then is haunted by the Filipina savage, the subject of direct military violence during US rule since the Philippine constabulary continued to suppress um, indigenous, uh, indigenous peoples as well as peasant movements um, that imagined uh, Philippine independence. The blurred image is again uh, from Ricky Punsalan and shows an American soldier posing with an unsmiling indigenous uh, Filipina. Now I move to images of the Filipina um, across time. We begin with our fascist present. The term fascist is a term that was in circulation during the regime of Ferdinand Marcos that began in 1965 and ended in 1986 with a popular uprising led by the middle class and Filipino liberal politicians. And since 2016, the current Philippine president, uh, Rodrigo Duterte, has embraced the term fascist. As Nefertita Diar put it, since the Philippines is a coalitional state in America's war on terror, Duterte's violent drug war um, is in fact a form of global fascism with the Philippine police as part of the American global war apparatus. By conducting a drug war, the Philippine state secures consent for the rule of war led by the US security state and secures consent for a culture where the enemies of the Philippine state must be executed. Duterte's fascism is a logic of violence and terror. Death is necessary to rid the Republic of the existential threat posed supposedly by drug addicts. This purging of the drug scourge, however, um, is really an alibi for the repression of other enemies of the, of the government. Um, critics of the administration, human rights activists, journalists, students, Lumad or indigenous people and the urban poor. And since the rise of Duterte to, um, to power in May 2016, many forms of state sanctioned violence have been met by thousands of Filipinos. Disappearances, torture, and extrajudicial punishments committed by the Philippine police or paramilitaries. More than 30,000 Filipinos, mostly from the slums of the country, have been killed by Duterte's so called drug war. The drug killings are considered by some scholars as a genocide of the poor, but also as an extension of the brutal US-led counterinsurgency military and paramilitary campaigns uh, conducted to secure American imperial power since the Cold War. And in Duterte's Philippines, um, in December 2018, he made these connections clear by ordering the Philippine military to destroy and kill the Philippine left. The rise of Duterte fascism is also a moment of a local and transnational opposition led by photographers, journalists, artists, uh, sorry, artists and fiction writers, sort of collapsed art and writers. Anyway, um, Sarah Duterte, who will run as her father's surrogate, is now the fascist in a terno. The terno continues to be popular in the era of Duterte. An Instagram account called Fashionable Filipinas shows the national dress is embraced without the abject histories of empire. And here we see various styles of the terno from uh, black and white archival photographs taken from an American museum and library collections to the contemporary terno um, of Filipino designers. The large photograph on the right is a rare photograph of the former president, Corazon Aquino, wearing a Ray Valera terno on her, um, on her wedding day. 
While the Instagram stories on fashionable Filipinas consist of old and new photographs, as well as um, uh, parts of books on Filipino fashion history, what is inescapable um, is the image of the most famous Filipina who popularized the Terno, Imelda Marcos. Um, a few images of, the, of Imelda can be found uh, on, this, uh, on this Instagram page. A scholar such as Denise Cruz, Genevieve Plutario, Talita Espiritu, Eriza Ong Baren, uh, Gre uh, Greta Ainu, and others have written, um, Imelda weaponized the Terno. Fashion is an important repertoire of myth-making for autocrats. So think of Imelda's Terno as well as her uh, beehive hair style, uh, Marcos's Barong Tagalog, Narendra Modi's Kuta jacket ensemble, or General Suharto's military fatigues. Aside from political repression and killing critics of the regime, dictators use strategies such as fashion to create myths that inspire and legitimate, um, uh, sorry, legitimize uh, state violence. Fascism in its Philippine sense refers to the era of the conjugal dictatorship of Ferdinand Marcos and Imelda Marcos, as well as the current regime of Duterte. The late Asian studies scholar, Benedict Anderson, once described the first lady as a Manilenia Miss Piggy and Ferdinand Marcos as a highly intelligent fascist. While Imelda was no Manilenia since she's what I, um, Benedict Anderson perhaps meant to draw attention to Mrs. Marcos' infamous appetite for collecting shoes and jewelry, as well as her capacity for violence. The intimacies of self-fashioning and fascism are well-documented in German and Italian histories. Hitler, for example, carefully stage-managed his official photographs to visually present himself as a supreme commander, one who was both a political leader and a brilliant military strategist, even though he actually had limited war um, experience. These acts of self-fashioning um, created the visual politics of Hitler as uh, Hitler's cult of genius. For Imelda Marcos, on the other hand, hers was a cult of beauty. Her terno and her bouffant were political signs of the regime, visual markers of Filipino nationalism and modernity. As Ramona Diaz's 2004 satirical documentary Imelda shows, both Marcos's, uh, Imelda and Ferdinand, understood the power of imagery and myth-making, how state spectacles such as staged photographs um, offer loud and important spells. Using their media curated image following the Kennedys or by presenting themselves as a Philippine Camelot, the Marcos couple and by extension, the Marcos children promoted a nationalist visual rhetoric defined by charisma, youth, newness, innocence, and beauty. These themes would be the basis for the Marcos cult of fascist modernity, a political vision based on the cult of genius, beauty, and as we know from our country's history, blood or violence. During the Marcos regime, what circulated was a beautiful image of Imelda in a terno. And now I want to offer a care warning because um, the next slide will, will show images of extrajudicial killings during the regime. So I'm going to do that now. These are rare photos because they did not circulate or were ever seen during martial law. The abject history of Imelda's Terno is the human rights violations uh, committed by the Philippine military and police during the regime. In 1965, uh, Marcos rode on a presidential campaign promising law and order and won. For the next two decades, the regime the themes of building a new society by focusing on culture, order, beauty, and progress would be the pillars of the Marcos state. This regime of beauty was also a regime of blood, borrowing from the work of gender studies scholar um, Ferdinand Lopez. In 1972, in the weeks following the declaration of martial law, the regime arrested 50,000 alleged uh, subversives. During the regime, the police were increasingly brutal, using torture and extrajudicial killings as standard procedure against both political dissidents and petty criminals. As historian Alfred McCoy wrote, um, under the Marcos military, quote, 
Murder was the apex of a pyramid of terror with 3,257 killed and an estimated 35,000 Filipinos tortured and some 70,000 arrested. Thinking of the Terno and fascism together, we could imagine the increase of human rights abuses under the Marcos regime and how this coincided with the dissemination of hundreds of photographs of the Marcos family in government controlled print media, such as newspapers, fashion magazines, cover, um, government publications, travel handbooks, postal stamps, and more. In other words, the rise of accounts of systematic and severe torture, rapes, and extrajudicial killings during the regime were accompanied by a, system, a, a systematic production of the Marcos family as fascist spectacles. What was visible was the bodies of the Marcos family, in particular, the image of Imelda. What was invisible were the news and images of extrajudicial killings, though this would change in the last years of the regime. At the moment, Sara Duterte is the new fascist in Eterno. Here she poses with her father and her loyal, and her father's loyal crony, who's also loyal to her, uh, Senator Bongo. Uh, and Senator Go will be um, Sarah's running mate for the 2022 Philippine presidential elections. This image recalls what scholars of fascism describe um, as the fascist matrix. Fascism as a language is about metaphors, values, feelings about violence, and since fascism is an ideology of violence, myths about the leader, and finally, fascist notions on the sacred and the abject. In this image, the sacred is, of course, the body of Duterte, his daughter Sara, and the crony Bongo. The fist they made is a signature of Duterte when he ran as president in 2015. The Duterte fist appears in the websites and social media accounts of Duterte supporters who call themselves DDS or diehard Duterte supporters. Coincidentally, DDS also stands for Davao Death Squads, the anti-communist paramilitary groups active during Duterte's tenure as mayor of Davao. In lieu of a conclusion, I wanted to share images of what I consider as visuals of, Fil of Filipino politicized abjection, the mierda y sangre or shit and blood of the AIDS patient theorized by queer study scholar Alberto Sandoval, um, and, this, and he terms this as politicized objection, um, becomes the shit and blood of fascism. This image is a still photo from Filipina filmmaker Alex Arumpak's award-winning documentary, Aswang, which translates as monster. And of course, you will know who the monster is in um, Arumpak's documentary. The documentary follows the life of Joe Marie, um, a boy living in the slums of, Ma of Manila, who grieves for his friend, Kian de los Santos, a 17-year-old who was killed by the police on suspicion of drug use, though there was no evidence at all. On this slide, we see the calloused, veiny hands of, the, of urban poor men arrested by the Philippine police for drug use um, and drug selling. Since Duterte came to power, he fulfilled his campaign promise of killing criminals. For the regime, drug users were criminals, animals that, had, that only deserved death. In his public speeches, Duterte normalizes a fascist logic. To bring modernity and order to the Philippine Republic, there must be a purging of criminals and other malcontents. Death is a fitting end for those who break the law and for the regime, drug users do not deserve treatment or rehabilitation, but only punishment and death. Arumpak's documentary um, questions this fascist logic by examining the living targets of state violence, the poor of Manila. The film is an example of Filipina feminist filmmaking through abjection. Arumpak's feminist gaze does not merely rec record um, death, but grants life by humanizing those targeted and rejected by the Philippine state. Arumpak's uh, politicized abject lens focuses lovingly on the bodies of the poor with no distance, as though she wants us to see the large and small wounds, the blood, and sh the blood and the shit of the fascist state. Throughout the film, 
we have close-ups of bodies of men, women, and children who describe their lives under the Duterte regime. We hear their voices. The police are our enemy. They shot a boy while he was feeding birds. They took my husband and shot him like an animal. They tortured and killed my teenage son. Arumpak's feminist method of filming is through politicized objection. And a final care warning, these next images show images of um, victims of extrajudicial killings um, and a funeral wake uh, for a boy killed by the police. The photographers, um, Eloisa Lopez, Siriaco Santiago, Rafi Lerma, and Ezra Akayan are part of a new generation of photojournalists nicknamed the Night Crawlers of Manila. And there are probably about more than a dozen of them who work um, on the, the, what is called the night shift. The grueling schedules begin at nightfall. They rush to the site of a murder or multiple murders, hurrying to photograph the corpses in the dark before the police take the dead to, mor to morgues or to funeral parlors that charge the victim, uh, the victim's uh, family, tens of thousands of pesos with a significant cut for the police who give them business. These are near impossible working conditions, low lighting, the, sm the smell of blood, sewage and fear, and the hostility of some Philippine police. Yet they continue to share their photographs of extrajudicial killings um, in various media. In October 2018, as a response to the violence of the Philippine state, we launched Dark Lens, Lenten and Karimlan, the Filipino camera in Duterte's Republic, on the website of the SUNY Stony Brook Center for the Study of, of Inequality, Social Justice, and Policy. Um, the online, um, webs the online um, uh, art project is still uh, there, um, and it features the work of the four photographers that I just showed. Um, the photographs were accompanied with original brief captions and poems by 40 scholars, poets, and artists from the Philippines and North America. And my co-curators uh, include Pia Arboleda from the University of Hawaii, Manila-based writer Francine Marquez, editor Cor um, Claire Cunihan, and Sarita C. from UC Riverside. When I shared the photographs with the scholars, poets, and artists, I gave general instructions to allow for the elicitation of meanings and emotions. The photographs were visual prompts that I hope would allow for the writers to dwell on objection and write about it um, in their work. While I never mentioned objection, I believe the photographs would lead the writers to politicized objection by seeing Filipino bodies in pain, bodies covered in blood and torture marks. The photographs, I think, are very powerful images of um, abjection, um, abject in those images of the dispossessed of the Duterte state. I want to end with two final images on the abject and the sacred. If we think of social justice as something beautiful and sacred. First, the abject. Uh, this is a slide from the cover of Gina Apostol's historical novel, Insurrecto. The title refers to uh, the term um, insurrectionist or rebel. And it was a term used by the American colonial government against Filipinos who refused to recognize US rule. The, of course, not recognizing the US rule meant you would be uh, arrested. Apostol's novel disarticulates the linear narrative of empire through the novel's intentionally dizzying triptych structure. Divided into three eras, the narratives of the winning protagonists in the novel collect um, connect in a kaleidoscopic way in three historical moments, 1898, the era of empire, the 1970s or the Marcos regime, and the current Duterte regime. Apostol's novel is about what is hard to see, that is, what is hard to translate in Philippine and American histories. Apostol tries to and successfully connects the histories of empire, war, and fascism through her novel. Ironic and satirical with many moments that ask the reader to question history and ways of seeing, Insurrecto is a novel about the legacies of empire as told through the intersecting lives of women in different periods. The female characters are the abject narrators of the novel. As the immigrant character of Magsalin asks, 
and this is a quote from uh, the novel. The question, it seems to me, is how to keep the past from recurring. I mean, what the fuck is the point of knowing history's goddamn repetitive spirals if we remain its bloody victims? And, and that's a quote from the novel. The novel Insurrecto is a literary text that narrates the traumas of empire in different forms, on different bodies, and in different eras. As a Philippinex or Filipino diasporic text, the novel is about the ideas of empire, the horror and humor of empire, and its legacies for its living bloody victims, both Filipinos in the Philippines um, and Filipinos in the global diaspora. Apostol's historical and postmodern novel is an example of the literary afterlives of empire and fascism. In one scene, the American doctor Griswold explains that the ordinary miracle of stereopsis or the binocular vision is important to the creation of empire. So the emergence of the Holmes viewer or the stereoscope in the late 19th century became an important moment in the creation of empire. As the character, um, the filmmaker character Chiara writes in her script, she, she writes, Americans manufactured how to see the world. My project on Filipina abjection attempts a different mode of seeing and witnessing in this era of disinformation, social media trolls, uh, loyal to the regime and acts of state repression, such as the arrest of activists and the continuing extrajudicial killings that are happening even in the pandemic. There must be more than beauty when we see the Terno. Rather than physical beauty, I want to end with an image of beauty as social justice. Uh, and this final slide is a photograph of the sociologist priest, Father uh, Danny Pilario, who offers food assistance to families of victims of the extrajudicial killings. Um, and I want to end there. Um, and I want to thank everyone who has come to join us. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I I know that you know given the the virtual circumstances uh, of Zoom lectures, right? We can't we can't all hear the round of applause that we're all collectively giving uh, Professor Balse right now. But I, I hope that you all are actually doing it. Um, uh, before we jump in, so we have about fifteen minutes uh, for question our question and answer session. Um, we have a couple questions already populated. Um, I will start us off with a question of my own, um, just to give folks some time, hopefully, um, to to make sure that you get in there and you ask the questions um, that you would like to hear Professor Balsay address in regards to this really fantastic um, uh, presentation. Um, Narissa, I have, I have a, a, couple, a couple questions that um, really stem from, I think, the, the final move of your presentation um, uh, in terms of referencing Gina Postle's novel, Insurrecto. This, this notion of, of stereopsis um, uh, is being kind of a fundamental way to think through uh, the, the, you know, the Philippine-American social relation, right? Uh, is like a mutually imbricated social relation, right? That changes and shifts, but is nonetheless like ever present for the kind of long durée of the 20th century. In my mind, I love this idea of, of doubling um, because I think that what your presentation so beautifully encapsulated um, uh, uh, in, in really painful ways at times, you know, to, to, to see the, the kinds of abject horrors, right? That, that we're ultimately talking about. Um, a kind of doubled viewing across three different periods. Um, and so to the way that I'm understanding um, uh, your presentation and your work, right, there, there's a way in which we have a doubled viewing. So the first is this idea of, you know, this really provocative idea of yours, right? And, and these, are your, this, these are your words, resisting the beauty of the Terno by tracking its circul circulation in time from the early 20th century to our current moment. Um, in my mind, the, the image of the Terno and its, and its translation from a symbol of empire right into a, a symbol of explicit fascism becomes one of the first series of the doublings. So we have uh, the, the, the photographs um, from the Commonwealth era of Filipinas in Ternos um, as being uh, rendered as kind of objects of empire, right? These are symbols of empire. But then a curious kind of translation occurs. Once we get to, to um, Emil de Marcos and the New Society, um, the, the Filipina in the Terno, right, to, to borrow your language, the fascist in, in the Terno, right, um, is now a subject of fascism, a subject with the agential capacity for, for fascist um, uh, behavior, right? 
Um, and then carrying on that further, right, in its most explicit form to Ser Duterte and Ser Duterte now being the most recent iteration of the fascist and the Terno. So I'm, I'm seeing that kind of tracking across with the image of the Terno as this, as this figure. But then going back to this notion of, you know, the, the stereopsis from, from Gina's novel, there's, there are these other images, right? And these, and these become the sort of other ways in which we can see um, attendant across those three different periods. Um, and I think, you know, the first maybe could potentially, you know, going back to, to Insurrecto could potentially be, um, you know, uh, the, the circulating images of, of uh, you know, massacres from the Philippine American War, like the Bangika massacre that are showing up on these stereo cards. Um, the, the images that you showed, the really painful images of salvaging um, that you showed from the Marcos Martial Law period being the other um, sort of, you know, uh, doubling. Uh, and then the, the photographs um, by the, the night crawlers um, of, of EGKs in, in Duterte's um, uh, Philippines today being that kind of other doubling. Um, so seeing that kind of doubling in terms of the images, right? This is, you know, a Filipina in Eterno first, right? As an object of empire, but then with um, Imelda Marcos and then also with Ser Duterte becoming a subject of fascism. And then the kind of abject death, right? Across these, these other um, sort of images underneath. In my mind, I couldn't help but thinking about a, a, striking, um, a striking kind of uh, difference that it seems as if for the first two, for the American Commonwealth period and then the Marcos martial law period, all of the stuff that you were reminding us about in terms of Imelda Marcos and her campaign of beautification, you know, uh, her, her compassionate society that goes along with you know, her husband's new society, her whole idea of the new Filipina at this particular moment, it seems really invested in hiding the those scenes of of murder of death right of of of, of killing whereas the 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 really important political work that you're calling politicized abjection by the by the photographers of the night crawlers there's this weird way at least my understanding of it that you know even faced with that that real veracity of these horrific images um of of duterte's war on drugs and i'm using the scare quotes here right because we know it's actually not that it's something completely else that it kind of, it's emboldening, right? So in, in a sense that there's a way in which the, the US, right, didn't want the images of the Balangiga massacre, right, to circulate. The sense that the Marcos regime didn't want the images of, of you know, salvaged killings um, to circulate. That something seems to have shifted that, that Duterte, even when faced with public outcry on all of the images that are now circula circulating globally, that it, it's kind of, created a condition of emboldening. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering just to hear some of your thoughts about that, because it seems like it is, it marks a, a strange kind of departure in the sense that faced with this, the, these types of photographs, like there's a way in which like even that seems at times, right, to not be enough, right, that, that instead it actually doubles down, right, on Duterte's fascist authoritarianism. So I'm just wondering to see if you have any thoughts on that, and then I'll go ahead uh, and start to read the questions that we have from our chat. Oh, Narisa, you're, you're muted. Of course I'm muted. Um, <laughs> um, thank you uh, for the question, um, Alden. You are right that there is something different. Um, of course, photography and how it works will, will change um, uh, the way meanings change for an image like the Terno. Um, the effect of an image changes as well. Um, I, I think that, I think that the conditions, uh, the conditions of the photographs, you know, how photographing in the slums and how, um, how the photographers try to, to capture the life of those that died because of the extrajudicial killings, um, I think that it will have that effect of, well, what scholars of photography say that there could be a numbing, people won't care. Um, I think that it also, there's another way to read that rather than numbing, I also think that, of course, it's it's terrifying. The, the images are, um, you know, they, they make people, um, be afraid of the police, be afraid of Duterte, that, that's very intentional. And so um, I think that 
I think that photographs of the extrajudicial killings under the Duterte regime um, work in very difficult and different ways. Maybe I'm being naive. I, I insist and I want to um, respect the, the political work of the photographers who keep recording the horror, you know. Um, maybe a way to see this horror is to think of how the doubling down, as you mentioned, insisting on continuing the violence um, is precisely because people will resist. Um, I'm thinking, um, and my memory, um, you know, I, it, it's not very accurate. I think that I should go back to historical studies of the regime, but there was, there, I think there were more killings in the last years of the regime. That it was just, it was just even crazier. Um, uh, the reason why um, there are photographs of paramilitaries that I was able to show in, a, in my presentation is because photographers were able to go to Dapao and take photographs of these um, anti-communist paramilitary. You know, um, they were very proud that they chopped the head of uh, a communist rebel. You know, they, they posed for the photographers. They weren't scared. So, um, Maybe there's something about, um, you know, the full-on horror of the state um, that it does this out of desperation. I want. I, I believe that the regime knows that uh, there are there's pressure on the regime. You know, um, the eyes of. I want to believe that the eyes of the world are, are looking at, uh, you know, uh, what is happening in the Philippines. Um, I think that the term, that the name of Duterte is synonymous with um, the extrajudicial killings. And so, so I, I don't really have an answer to your question, but I, I think that the doubling down is more an indication of the, um, how the regime is more perhaps desperate. Uh, it, and I, I think also because of who Duterte is, because he came from Davao, which was the laboratory for, um, you know, counterinsurgency. Um, he he brought that culture of death squads with him to to Malacanang, and so um, this open oh, this openness of like you know having killed people is part of the culture of the death squads. It is also a part of Duterte's, you know, murderous masculinity, his fascist masculinity. He's very proud that he's killed. So I, I don't have an answer to the doubling, but I, I think that um, I want to believe that it's, you know, I think that that it's still necessary to look at these images and to, to you know, resist and question the regime. Um, but I think it's also an indication of, of the desperation of the regime. Yeah, that's I think that's a, a really important point, you know, and, and it does also mark that difference between, you know, Duterte being proud, right, that he's actually a murderer versus you think of the lengths that, um, you know, Ferdinand Marcos went to exonerate himself uh, from the murder charge that he got, you know, when he was when he was young, you know, I think that's kind of interesting that that kind of difference, you know. Um, just for the sake of time, Narisa, if it's okay, um, I'm going to combine two questions. Uh, so these two questions, um, the first seems to be asking, continuing this idea about the public nature. Um, so the, the commenter writes, the Duterte killings seem to be very public, also because they're occurring usually in, in crowded urban slums. Uh, yeah. And then... And then uh, kind of adding on to this, um, uh, we have a question that's I'm wondering about the, the dangerous uh, work um, by the nightcrawler photographers who are engaged uh, in this politicized abjection work. Um, how dangerous is it for them um, if their work is being circulated in the kind of global ways that it is? Thank you. Um, uh, was there a question about the public nature of, of the killings? Thinking, thinking about that distinction that, right, it's a very public kind of display, right? Ah, the yes, yes. Killings yes. themselves, right, even before yeah. they're photographed or meant to be public, right? Well, I, I, this goes back to the culture of the death squads, um, you know, how um, uh, the paramilitary, the anti-communist death squads from Davao um, would really use... Um, would really use 
theater to to terrify um, community members, you know, so they would leave heads or they would um, leave bodies um, for uh, people to see. Um, and uh, it is not a coincidence that the former chief of police, uh, who's now a senator, uh, Ronaldo ba uh, um, de la Rosa, Ronaldo de la Rosa, or his nickname is Bato, um, General De La Rosa um, was, was very much active in paramilitary killings uh, in Davao. He, he cut his tooth in the counterinsurgency campaigns um, in Davao. Um, so there was a joke made by one writer um, in the Philippines uh, who told me um, uh, the death squads are in power now. The death squads are in power in Malacanang. Um, and, and the joke is actually, you know, literally real, you know. The um, you know the life, the career of General De La Rosa, now Senator De La Rosa, is an example of how um, the counterinsurgency operations in Davao have moved onto the national scale. Um, I think it was uh, the poet um, uh, Marni Quilates who said that the national policy of the Philippine government is is death, is killing. You know, so um, the public nature, I think comes from that history of counterinsurgency operations, uh, you know, in um, what was Davao. Uh, the second question about the dangerous work of the, um, the uh, nightcrawler photographers. Um, yes, it, it's, it's very dangerous. I'm very um, uh, honored and um, humbled to, uh, you know, um, know their work and, and, and um, support them by, um, by organizing the online exhibit um, with the four photographers. Um, while the work is, is very dangerous, um, uh, I'm also very moved by um, how um, the, the, the photographers, when um, they met, um, I, I guess I can say this, um, uh, when they met in Sarita C, one of the editors of the, you know, of the art exhibit, when she asked the photographers um, what should be next after the online exhibition, we asked them if they wanted to have a book. And they said that um, they would, they want a book that is not about them as artists or photographers. They weren't interested in that kind of an art book. They wanted a book that would help people um, understand the history of the Philippines. They wanted a kind of primer that would um, would make people understand why we have a fascist like Duterte in power and what is happening in the drug war. Um, and so um, I think that um, I think that all I think that all great artists are are very political and brave. Um, and I think that the photographers that I showed, I think that they're that way. Um, you know, um, and uh, I, I think that um, what also makes me feel um, very happy is that um, the four of them have have gone on to um, very good um, jobs. They're connected to American or, um, you know, international um, presses. Um, uh, and uh, Brother June uh, or Siriaco Santiago continues with his apostolate with his work um, because he's um, among the four he's the the, the uh, missionary um, and he believes that his photography is is uh, an apostolate it's part of his work as uh, um, you know um, someone who is a missionary so I to, to answer um, your question yes the work is dangerous the work is necessary um, and I also think uh, you know as odd as it may seem some of the photographs of the horror are quite artistic um, and uh, very moving, very, um, I don't want to say beautiful, but I guess that's what we could use.
Right. Yeah. The, the, I mean, they definitely have that aesthetic quality, right? Um, mm. A lot of them do. I think that's a, a good point to bring up. Um, I think th this, these are going to be this, the last cluster of questions just uh, for sure. the sake of time before we, um, we say thank you to you. Um, so I'm going to do my best to synthesize three questions uh, into yeah. one. Um, and they all have to do um, with, with their nose. Uh, so the first um, is uh, we have a question about the documentary, uh, The Kingmaker. Uh, and oh. this, this, uh, <laughs> Uh, this person is asking a question um, about a, quote, a direct quote from Imelda Marcos saying that the poor, this is a quote from Imelda Marcos, the poor always look for a star in the dark of the night, end quote. And this, yeah. and this, this question is asking to, you know, to justify her extravagant, extravagant taste. Does this statement by Imelda Marcos, do you think, propagate the idea of abjection. And then continuing this, um, uh, this, this kind of notion here, um, there uh, is a question about, you know, the, um, someone observing that nowadays the term, the terno among Filipinas um, uh, are used mostly by the famous and rich, okay. specifically politicians. Um, do you okay. think this is an indication of fascism or is it just more innocuously uh, fashion sense? And then a final question on the terno. Um, one of, and it has to do with one of the, the, the images that you actually showed, one of the ternals uh, you showed seemed to be designed uh, to imitate a splatter of blood across the front. I'm mm -hmm. wondering if you have anything to add as to how variations on the terno or, or, uh, or other kinds of oppositions to it have been used as resistance. Mm. Yeah, oh, great questions. Uh, the first question, um, uh, anything from Imelda's mouth is not about objection. It's about fascism. So no, it's, I, I don't think it's about um, uh, objection at all. Um, uh, and again, it's about creating her myth, right? Creating, um, bolstering her myth as, uh, you know, as, as, as an icon of beauty. And I, I question that she's really an icon of fascism. Uh, the second question, um, I think that the Terno is, I think that the Terno is, is a favorite of politicians um, because of its history. Um, I think it is, well, for one, it's, uh, I can't avoid this word, it's beautiful, you know, it is. Um, uh, and it goes back to um, the colonial era. I think that when politicians wear a terno, um, it is uh, to signal their awareness of the cultural weight of a terno, um, it, it, I guess it's like our Philippine kimono, like the, with the way the kimono is for the Japanese. Um, you wear it during national um, important formal occasions. Um, so politicians are aware of that. They're aware of the magic of the terno and they, they, they you know, they're aware of, of how it registers visually. And so people uh, are drawn to it. Um, the third question about uh, the Tierno um, is, is something that I um, didn't do for this presentation. I've done it before. Um, in 2016, Aimee um, uh, um, Marcos made the mistake of wearing, it was her 60th birthday, I think. She made the mistake of wearing a Tierno that was deep blood red. And the activists had a heyday. They loved it. They placed like, you know, um, skulls and corpses on the feet of um, Aimee. Um, uh, she uh, had no idea that that was what was going to happen. And so, uh, yes, the, the Terno is also being used um, um, as, uh, you know, as a, a sign of resistance um, in Philippine life. Thank you so much for those responses, Professor Balsa. And with that, uh, I want to thank everyone uh, for attending uh, this, this lecture uh, by the Transnational Asia Speaker Series in the Chow Center. Um, but most importantly, we want to thank Professor Balsa um, for the amazing presentation and lecture that she just uh, gave. Um, I'm going to go ahead before we actually leave. I'm going to drop a link uh, in the chat that hopefully all the attendees can get um, to the project that Professor Balsa um, was referencing and has worked really hard on in terms of the Dark Lens uh, project um, with, with uh, amazing individuals involved. So do take a look at that as well. Uh, so thank you to everyone uh, for, for showing up today.